I am with John Spence from the Department of Physical Education and Recreation in Edmonton at the University of Alberta. Hi. Hello. And uh, you are a specialist of the uh, intervention as a, with the population. So that is that has more to do with uh, prevention. Yes. Yes, it does. Yeah. So, um, what are the key factors that uh, can apply to the population uh, compared to the individual? Uh, well, in the population or at the population level, we might consider where people live. Um, so the factors or environments that influence uh, what they may do on a daily basis, more so than we would at an individual level. So if you are um, working on the environment, uh, what kind of environment uh, that could be uh, more efficacious? Uh, well, uh, we know that uh, where people live influences the, uh, s the types of food or how much food they may consume. Uh, also, there's a fair amount of evidence that where they live uh, may influence how active, physically active they are, particularly how um, if they engage in active transportation, so commuting to and from work uh, for children walking to and from school or biking to and from school. Um, so there's a fair amount of evidence to suggest that uh, there's certain aspects of the urban environment that will influence those things. Talking about urban design, uh, the new urban design are very nice, but not very uh, helpful to make people moving. Uh, yeah. So what uh, people may know as um, the more they're more typical of the suburban uh, neighborhoods. Uh, those neighborhoods are very good for people um, if you know if they if they have a car and they're going to be commuting uh, with a car, but they're not so good for promoting uh, walking. Um, mainly because there's few destinations for you to go to and also the way the street network is set up it it restricts uh, the um, uh, sort of variability and opportunity to go places. It's very difficult to redesign um, a district or a city so what kind of intervention that could help to make people uh, walking uh, better in such environment? Well uh, there could be a few things. One could be that Uh, we could advocate for uh, smarter design of the neighborhood. So yes, we're not going to be able to go and uh, change all the current or existing neighborhoods, but we might be able to, for instance, put in walking trails or bike paths that link, and if you imagine in the suburbia type neighborhood, which are often in sort of loops, that could link those loops to one another so they're now a bit more connected. Uh, that could be one strategy that could occur at that level. Uh, it, At, at the more individual level, uh, challenging uh, families to and, and parents in particular to be aware that um, you know the, the, where they're living can restrict their opportunity to be active. Uh, so getting them to be just a bit more mindful about that too. And uh, so that is about uh, transportation and urban design. There is other strategies that can be. Uh, Can involve the population, and we are talking about advertisement um, and also uh, food pricing mm -hmm. and taxes. Yes. Uh, can you could you talk about the new initiative about that uh, involve taxes in Canada? On the food side, there is quite a lot of interest on taxing what might be considered the unhealthy foods or junk food or uh, the high fat foods, high caloric foods. Um, And in fact, there's just a recent, uh, I was just reading today, uh, an op-ed in the New York Times uh, where they were talking about that. The, the main issue that I would have with taxing one type of food is that, um, you, that it may be regressive and that the people who are going to be penalized the most are the, the people who actually need to be supported. Um, so if you're going to tax one food, Uh, you should consider subsidizing the healthier foods, for instance, the fruits and vegetables, right. which tend to be much more expensive, uh, lower caloric uh, foods, but uh, high in fiber and, and vitamins and so forth and nutrients. Um, That's the example, for example, of uh, sweet beverages. Yes. Uh, you, yeah. if, if you want to tax uh, sweet beverages, is because you want to decrease the consumption. Yes. And, but what, were they, what will be uh, replaced Yeah. Who pays by? Well, Is it be milk or, or? Well, I guess, yes. I'm sure some would lobby and, and want it to be milk. Uh, it could be water, for instance, too. Not um, very popular. Yeah, not, not as popular. Um, uh, so, yes, uh, w depending on what the uh, 
you know, the food and the food type is that you're taxing, there should be always a consideration, I think, of the subsidizing. Um, you know, taxes are attractive to governments in one way because they generate revenue, uh, but they might not be popular depending on the, the political perspective that you take. What do, what do you think about the, the regulation of advertisement, uh, especially with, with kids? Uh, could, it, could it change something? Uh, is it important? I think it's important, and there's definitely a movement on an international level now, uh, particularly in, in uh, Europe and in Australia and New Zealand, uh, and it's starting to take, uh, uh, you know, get some legs in North America to start to regulate it. Obviously, depending on uh, how sort of pro-commercial your uh, society is, it, it, um, it may have some uh, resistance. But no, I think it's one piece. It will not be a solution. Um, I think we would be naive to believe that uh, just because a child is during, you know, Saturday morning is not going to see advertisements for McDonald's, that they would still not be pressing their parents to go to McDonald's. There's many ways that, particularly in this day and age of the internet and so forth, that we become aware of, of products and material. Is there some uh, research that proved the efficiency, uh, effectiveness, effectiveness of these um, approach yeah. that can help to uh, go further with these approach? So there's, uh, there's some very interesting modeling studies, so where they take uh, data and they simulate what would happen if uh, you restricted, let's say, advertising. Uh, and that often shows to be a very cost-effective one, because it doesn't cost uh, at least the, the agencies or the governments that are trying to impose the ban. It doesn't cost them that much. Uh, food companies would argue it will cost them a lot. Um, but uh, there's few studies, as far as I'm aware, that have shown that there's a, a direct link between restricting regulation or restricting advertising and then a change in uh, consumption patterns, for instance, of children. Uh, Quebec is a province that does have regulations on it and has long had regulations. Some countries in Scandinavia and I believe New Zealand and Australia are moving on that now. Um, but there, there's more and more research I know that's being done now to, to examine that. We know that education is important, but uh, often education means information and it doesn't seem to be uh, uh, to have uh, effectiveness of interventions. Uh, what do you think about uh, these kind of approaches? Education is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Uh, and also, depending on the, um, uh, the level of development uh, uh, of the country uh, and the education system in the country, uh, education may be just, uh, uh, as I say again, it might be a necessary thing, but you might need to add more. Where there's an interesting, some interesting research that's recently come out that's shown in underdeveloped countries, education might be a very cost-effective way uh, to promote, uh, in, in a health promotion context, to promote certain uh, behaviors and uh, change other behaviors. Uh, but yes, we need education. Uh, but we need to do more than that, for sure, because going back to the example of the urban design, if we are encouraging um, families to be you know, walking more, active commuting, and so forth, well, if they live in a neighborhood that would prevent that or restrict that, then uh, you know, the education is not going to help all that much. We have interventions that involve the cities, uh, communities, and school that are the, the three most uh, example that I can find. Which one is would be a priority as an intervention of the, of the to the population level? Well, it, it partially depends on what the target is. If if you're focusing, let's say, on childhood obesity, then schools are often the uh, sort of an obvious uh, setting to look at. Uh, but um, you know, schools are. Uh, because of that fact, schools are often overburdened. Uh, the main responsibility of school is to, to deliver curriculum. And so if we're trying to put in place some uh, larger health promotion program, uh, that I think it puts a lot of a burden on the schools. So I think focusing at the community, uh, looking at after school hours, what do children do when they leave school? Between three to six, what are children doing? Uh, the, these, what they're calling critical hour period now, I think is an important time to understand what's going on. Uh, but yeah, I would prefer to step back from a school setting and look at the community more. Family seems to be a key factor in the population interventions. How could it work or how, 
how, what kind of support we can give to family and parents. Yeah. There is a lot of pressure on parents, yeah. and uh, we, we, we ask them to do the impossible. Yeah. How, how, what kind of support we can give to families and especially parents? Yeah. I think sometimes, and this goes back to your question about education, it might be that uh, parents are not aware of, uh, uh, let's say, on physical activity, they're not aware of how much or how often their child should be physically active. So, for instance, Participation has a campaign out right now called Think Again, where they're just challenging parents that uh, if they think their child is phys sufficiently physically active, they probably are incorrect there. Uh, because we know that the, maj the vast majority of children are inactive, but we also know that the vast majority of parents believe their, child are, their children are active. Mm -hmm. So th that is something where participation action is targeted to say, okay, parents, uh, think again, your child may not be active, because in the future there will be other campaigns coming out now to provide resources and suggest how you could um, get your child to be more active. But it, we know if the parent already believes their child is active, they're not going to be receptive to those messages. Um, and then similarly, some of the questions around food and diet, uh, that's where, yes, okay, restricting your advertising to children, uh, subsidizing of healthier foods, those are all part of a, a, a bigger, um, you know, strategy, I think. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's unfair to blame parents, but there's no question they are part of the solution. So integration of uh, responsibility uh, shared between schools and cities and government on different levels. So uh, there is a, a big movement right now, right? Yes, I, I think so. And I think that you know, parents by and large want to do what's right for their children. Um, it's just that uh, if they're, you know, there's, as you mentioned before, there's lots of pressures on them. And there's lots of information that's out there. Again, so much information on the internet. Some of it might, might not be correct. So it's uh, important for us to be able to uh, get the, the right information out there and then advocate for um, sort of uh, wise, healthy policies. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thanks. So that was uh, John Spence with uh, Paul Boisvert at uh, Duchesne, Quebec, in the framework of the uh, Obesity Bootcamp 2011.